uploading. Okay, so we are now broadcasting live on YouTube. Um, so, and this webinar is being recording. So just so you all know that, and that YouTube recording will be available afterwards. So if you would like to watch this again, or anyone um, didn't have a chance to be here right now, you'll be able to watch the YouTube video later. Um, we'll send out the link, but you can also find the Rancho Los Cerritos YouTube channel and subscribe to it so that you'll get notified when we update with new videos. So there's a lot of cool long ago Long Beach videos, as well as Marie sharing um, gardening facts and all kinds of other cool content on there if you subscribe. Um, and then just one last time, we're in the webinar format now, but there will be a chance for all of you to share a little bit later on. Um, so in the meantime, use the chat, say hello, um, and then any comments or questions as we're going through. And with that, thank you, thank you again for your patience uh, with us starting a few minutes late. And we now have a very interesting program for you. Um, so we're going to actually shift a little bit. So I'm gonna hand it over to Laura. So we've got a little bit of an introduction before we get into the discussion about the history of water at Rancho Los Cerritos. Hey everyone. Um, I have some fun educational polls that we were gonna do at the end, but we can do at the beginning. Um, but Allison, do you wanna do your intro first? Or do you wanna do the poll? No, if you want me to do it now, that's fine too. I think that would make sense. Okay. All right. So hello everyone. It is great to see you all in this Zoom get together. I am so pleased to be able to share with you all the Looking Back to Advance Forward project, which is our stormwater retention and reuse project. Back in 2018, we applied for and were notified that we received a grant from the Port of Long Beach to put in a stormwater retention and reuse project. Studio 111, an architecture firm in Long Beach designed the conceptual project for us. And we want to be, give a big thanks to the Port of Long Beach who was very generous to us and we received a $1 million grant, which in essence covers two thirds of the cost of the project. We are currently in the middle of raising the additional funds for the project. And then after we received that fantastic $1 million grant, we reached out to Studio 111 again to move the project forward. We were also fortunate through some of our community partners to be introduced to P2S, who we contracted with to be the project manager for this project. We do have a timeline for the project and we expect that the project will be finished by mid 2022 and that the construction on this project will start in the spring of 2001 to meet that goal. I am very pleased to say that we have Greg Alexander, Senior Project Manager from P2S here on the Zoom tonight, who's going to present the project to everyone on this call. Marie will kick off the presentation with a brief history of water at the Rancho Los Cerritos. And then Greg will walk us through the projects. We're talking about the past, what we're doing now in the future. And there will be time after the presentation for Q&A. But right now, I just wanted to set up what our topic is for tonight. And I'm going to turn it over back to Laura to continue with the polls. Yes, where are my polls? More, there it is, polls. All right. Um, you'll be able to answer these questions. Uh, the first one is rain most rain Getting them rolling over halfway. Don't be wrong. 
transfer. All right, it looks like everybody that's going to has voted. With 3.14 inches of rain. So we'll get rid of that one and go to the next poll. Called Rains. So this one is multiple choice. I'm asking for the two months of the year that get the most rain. Oh, do you think the ranch uses at least a month? Vote for two months to fulfill this poll. All right, people are making good guesses here. All right, it looks like everybody that's going to vote has voted. And the most people voted for February just by a little bit. And actually, you would think that would be the right answer, but the right answer is. January and March, the people who guessed the most are is used the, in the over the past 24 months have used the least amount of water. We used um, in uh, about 7,000 gallons of water fill seven swimming pools, 12 by four feet by five feet. Okay, okay, I'm gonna jump in now. I think we're ready to go with Marie's presentation and then it'll be Greg Alexander from P2S. Thanks, Laura. Am I waiting for you to show your screen? I think you're good to go, Marie. I'm, I'm giving you the, the, the signal. <laughs> Change slides. <laughs> Megan, change slides. Okay. In 1844, Temple builds on high ground so his adobe host is safe from flooding but he depends upon the river for fresh water. Next slide. He installs a water ram using the power of the river to force water into a pipe, through a valve, then into a reservoir. When that hits capacity, the pressure forces the water into a delivery pipe and defying gravity, the water is pumped upsloped where it is released into a cistern. This is functional until the flow rate of the river is reduced by increased demand upstream, as well as by periodic droughts. Next slide. Rancho workers dig a well on site, reportedly 60 feet deep and six feet wide. To retrieve the water from that depth, he installs a well sweep to bring the water to the surface to be stored in cisterns. Next slide. From there, it could drain into canvas and leather hoses supplying residents an irrigating garden. Even this well dried up in the 1860s drought. Next slide. 
When the Bixby's purchased the property, they drilled 10 wells on their property. Striking an artesian spring, they added a windmill to pump water into a redwood water tower. Next slide. An iron pipe supplied gravity-fed water to garden spigots and to the house. Next slide. In 1931, Llewellyn and Avis Bixby's estate is on city water with all the mod cons. Next slide. Ralph Cornell includes underground irrigation and a small pond in the inner courtyard. Next slide. Runoff from rain is absorbed by the planted areas in the buffer zone, which prevents erosion. Next slide. The country club develops the land adjacent the rancho for an exclusive residential development. With no runoff coming from the rancho, no storm drains were installed. Next slide. In 1955, the house becomes a museum. Next slide. To provide parking, the city paved a large segment of the buffer zone. The asphalt caused rain to flow towards the property perimeter and erosion starts eventually flowing into the private road below. So the city's parking lot was the inside of that orange crooked line. Next slide. Another project in the 1980s was a volunteer who installed cobbles to slow the erosion channel. And the next slide. At the same time, a project removed a portion of the historic asphalt drive. They replaced it with a softer soil cement mix. Next slide. Runoff from the drive is now directed to a two and a half inch drain outlet. Flooding ensues. Next slide. The soft soil cement pulverized by the weight of vehicle starts crumbling. Several feet collapsed and the drive became undermined. The path the city added below periodically would get washed out. Next slide. In the 1990s, preservation of the soil cement was priority. A French drain was installed along the edge and boulders brought in to hold in place the remaining soil. Smaller boulders and cobbles would break the force of flooding before it hit a gravel bed intended to allow absorption while protecting the soil. Two drains were added at the lowest points of the slope to carry water under the path to an outlet in the cobbled erosion channel. Next slide. The drive was secure, but runoff from the parking lot continued to cause erosion and flood the road below. The campaign for retention basins starts and successfully gets added to the master plan. Next slide. In 2012, the visitor center is built. The asphalt parking lot is replaced by decomposed granite to provide a drive through for drop off and a simple open space for gathering. The DG presented a couple of problems. In wet weather, cars churned ruts, and while the design grade, unfortunately, watched the DG into the native garden. Next slide. Pots were installed to prevent cars driving through. Next slide. Sandbags were used to stem the eroding DG. Next slide. In 2014, the Port of Long Beach grants funds to renovate the California Native Garden. Next slide. And three basins are installed to the greatly enhanced dry stream bed. Next slide. This is a game changer for the neighbors below. And in most storms, we retain the runoff, losing water only in deluges. Next slide. Unfortunately, the DG continues to erode. Now it is filling the dry stream bed. Next slide. Additional sandbags are employed. Next slide. Meanwhile, the pulverized soil cement above washes into the driveway drain and that too silts up the dry stream bed. Next. A filtration sock is added around the drain to catch the particulate while allowing the water to seep through. Sandbags and filtration socks are effective but not attractive. They're also heavy and awkward to shift. Next slide. In 2018, Rancho staff submit a grant to the Port of Long Beach requesting funds to ensure 
that we capture as much rainfall as possible, redesign the surface outside the visitor center to eliminate erodible material, and redirect some of the runoff to the arroyo, which will reduce the volume on the stream bed. Next slide. We were awarded the grant and looking forward, looking back to proceed forward is initiated. Like the innovative visionaries of this site's past, we are looking at technology, simple and complex to manage the rancho's rainfall. And now we can go on to the next program. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Marie. And Thank you everyone for the opportunity to, uh, to, to share with you today. As Alice had mentioned, my name is Greg Alexander. I work with P2S. Uh, we're a Long Beach based uh, engineering firm. Uh, and I, I get the opportunity to, to present the project to you today that we're, we've been designing with the Rancho over the last uh, handful of months here. And uh, look, looking, uh, looking forward to completing our design and, and, uh, and watching this come to fruition. Today, I'll talk a bit about the design, what we're planning to do, and then wrap up with uh, a little description of how we see the sort of the construction going and the, the, the phasing there, and we'll leave some time for questions as well. As Allison mentioned, uh, we, we've got a great team working on this. Uh, Studio 111, who, who was uh, instrumental in, in helping uh, pursue the, the grant with the Port of Long Beach to come up with a conceptual design. They're, they're the architect on this project. And then JLA will, will be uh, designed in the civil engineering components of the project, which, which we'll discuss here as we get into it. This slide provides a, a brief overview of what, what we're talking about when, when we talk about this project. And I'll, I'll briefly walk through the elements here, and then we'll talk about those a little bit more in the following slides. On the right-hand side here in the driveway that leads up uh, from this, near the visitor center up towards the garage area of the rancho, we'll be installing permeable concrete there. And I'll, I'll talk more about that. In front of the visitor center, we'll have a, a permeable, permeable pavers. Uh, both of these will allow water to infiltrate as well as, uh, um, as, well as being uh, hardened against erosion. So, so both capturing water on site as well as, uh, as well as protecting the, the, the dry stream bed and, and, and the landscaping. Further down the driveway, uh, closer to the entrance, we'll, we'll have a couple of uh, exciting features. The first is an observation deck, which will allow visitors to look out over the arroyo, get a better sense of the, the landscaping there and the, and, and the property in general, provide a, a view that, that's, that's currently a, um, a, a bit obscured as, as folks go up the driveway. Also, here in the, uh, in the driveway itself, we'll be excavating there and installing a large cistern, a 22,000 gallon uh, concrete cistern underground there. And we'll talk more about this, but that will allow us to capture hold water on site, which it can then be, uh, can be, then be reused uh, for, for irrigation on site. And so our, our target, is, as, as we discussed, is how can, we, how can we protect the landscaping from erosion? How can we keep that water on site through a combination of, of infiltration and then uh, and that water that's not infiltrated? How can we capture it, hold it, and then beneficially reuse it on site? A couple, one other feature I should mention here. Uh, in, in our walkway, uh, as, as folks enter the site and, and, and come up uh, parallel with the driveway, we're planning to uh, install what we're calling a timeline walk, essentially a, a, a set of, of signage and, and uh, placards in, in the ground that allow us to, to tell the story of the rancho, as well as identify features of the, uh, of, of the, the stormwater features of the project. So moving on then from this overview, this is a, a couple uh, just cross sections of the site to, to Particularly what we're what we're talking about here. So again, this is looking if your if your back is to the essentially to the gate of the rancho, uh, you can see the cistern here on the far right hand side in blue, the observation deck overlooking the arroyo, and it, again you can see that the cistern is just underneath the driveway here. Another view, a different cross section now with your visitor center on the left, uh, Virginia Road on the right. You can see again. Uh, 
the, the slope of the arroyo, uh, as, as Marie mentioned, what, one of the other aspects of the project is making sure that we're purposefully uh, delivering water to, to the arroyo, that, that we can't capture or infiltrate, that, that we're making sure that the water goes, goes to the arroyo uh, where it can settle there and then, uh, and then overflow it if needed from, from there. Here are a couple examples of what we're talking about. Uh, again, the, uh, uh, the observation deck in the upper left, obviously the, the view will be slightly different than this example, but uh, you get a sense of what we're imagining here. You do see there's uh, some, some signage. We, we intend to have that uh, also throughout the project, um, highlighting the, uh, the features of the project. In the upper right, uh, this is a, an example of what we mean by permeable pavers. So these are um, stone pavers uh, that um, with, with space in between them, interlocking so they, so they don't move, they're, they're resistant to, to erosion and damage, but they, they do allow water to infiltrate uh, uh, during storm events. In the bottom right, this is a, an example of permeable concrete. So similar to concrete that you're used to, uh, but uh, slightly a coarser grain, and it allow, allows, again, allows water to, to infiltrate through, through that concrete as opposed to just, just running off and concentrating. And then uh, an example of what we, what we envisioned for the timeline walk. Again, uh, just, just an opportunity to uh, highlight features of the Rancho and features of the project. And then here, here's uh, some cut sheets, some examples of the, the cistern itself. Uh, as I mentioned, water that we don't infiltrate uh, will, will flow through the cistern, go through some, uh, some treatment, and then uh, be, be held there in the cistern. Uh, and then we, we can pump that out of there with a submersible, submersible pump in the cistern to be deployed to the, to the irrigation on site. Again, just uh, reusing the water that uh, that, that comes to the rancho uh, through rain events and, and capturing it until, uh, until we can use it and need it. I mentioned the signage. We, we, uh, the intention is to, 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 is to have signage around explaining each of these features. So as visitors come to the, to the rancho, you know, uh, we can show them what they're looking at as they stand in the observation deck enjoying the arroyo. We can make sure they, they notice the and understand the benefit of the, the, the paper pavers and impervial concrete, uh, as well as uh, um, just describing the, uh, the, the, the cistern and what, what's going on there. That will again be underground. So um, signage is a great opportunity to, to educate folks about that. And with that, I will shift over briefly to uh, a slightly more detailed drawing and I'll, I'll promise I will zoom in here. Uh, this provides a, a quick overview of, of the areas I just talked about, and I'll talk about some of the phasing that we imagine uh, for the project, about how long it'll take, and maybe some of the uh, thoughts about uh, mitigating disruptions as we, uh, as we actually build this project. As Allison mentioned, uh, the intention is to be complete with the project by mid-2022, starting in the uh, in the spring of next year, in the spring of 2021. So we're looking at approximately a 12-month construction period. And I'll, I'll zoom in here. My apologies for, for anyone uh, with, with uh, vertigo-type symptoms as I zoom in. Bear, bear with me. Uh, every construction project needs a laydown area, a place where the you know, construction equipment that's not actively in use can be, can be stored out of the way. Our intention is to use the, the large parking lot that's that's shared with the with the country club as a, as a laydown area. We call this phase zero mobilization, uh, approximately a month with the time for the contractor to to get on site, get get their equipment organized uh, before the actual uh, construction begins. We anticipate the contractor will then shift to what we're calling phase one here. Uh, installing the permeable concrete in the driveway that leads up to the uh, up to the garage area, the rancho. Uh, we expect this to take approximately three months, uh, uh, and you know, to to remove the existing sort of concrete soil, and then uh, and then install this uh, uh, 
this permeable concrete. One other feature that we're excited about for this project is that it gives us an opportunity to help the Rancho plan for the future. As, as you're likely aware, the, uh, uh, this, this area includes the, the footprint of the, uh, the planned uh, you know, future barn building. Since we're tearing this area up already, uh, we want to take this opportunity to install the utilities that will ultimately service that building once it is, once it is built. So we bring, we'll be bringing you know, IT infrastructure in for, you know, uh, over there. We'll be bringing in uh, the, the plumbing lines and the electrical lines that will, that will service that building. We'll just be stubbing them out for now, so, but they're there and they're ready uh, when, when that building comes to fruition. The benefit there, of course, is that we don't have to then uh, chew up this new, newly installed permeable concrete uh, um, to, to install those utilities after the fact. So that's phase one. Phase two will be in front of the visitor center, uh, where, where we're excuse me, where we're installing uh, uh, permeable pavers. You can see that in green here. Uh, the again, uh, as as we mentioned in this this area, we're we're moving the decomposed granite, the DG that's there, and, and installing a more more uh, ro robust uh, material that is a aids infiltration and b is uh, is uh, hardened against erosion. Uh, that phase will, will last uh, approximately two months as well. Phase three is where we start installing the, the observation deck, building out the observation deck, as well as installing the, the cistern. There will be approximately about a week period where we need to actually shut down the, the roadway to the Rancho, and that, that's something we'll, we'll plan in advance to, uh, to avoid disruptions. Finally, uh, phase four, we'll, we'll work on the uh, we'll work on the the walkway, installing the the, the timeline and making that a, a bit more uh, easily accessible for 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 visitors as as they enter the rancho. And we, we expect that final phase four to take about a month, and then there'll be about a month of, of demobilization where the contractors finishing off their final items, you know, doing final cleanup and, and removing their equipment. So that is the that is the broad overview uh, uh, of the project and and how we how we see it coming together. Uh, as promised, I do want to leave a, a bit of time in case folks have questions, uh, either through the chat or or otherwise. I know um, you know uh, you know a lot of the, the, the rest of the moderators. Uh, um, I'll, I'll I'll leave that to you to, to how you manage that. But I'd, I'd be happy to to field any questions now or or after the fact. Greg, we do have one question so far in the Q&A and everyone else is welcome to use the Q&A. It says, why is the plan cistern to be where it is? Why not install it at the lowest point or in front of the visitor center where it would be less disruptive during construction and more permeable soil? Uh, great question, uh, good question. We, we have looked at a, at a few opportunities uh, in terms of where, where to install the, the cistern. Uh, the, the area near, near the gate is, is a fairly low area. And so in that sense, we're, we're, um, we, we can take advantage of, of, of gravity to, to feed stormwater to, to that area. Uh, additionally, tearing up the, the asphalt roadway is, is fairly pain, painless. Uh, it, it's a straightforward thing to do. We won't be damaging any any of the existing you know landscaping or you know, trees that sort of thing. It, it's out of the way. If for whatever reason, I mean, there will be access ports to to maintain that that uh, that cistern. But if there was ever a need to to get more deeply into it, it could it could be accessed again uh, um, again without without damaging any uh, um, any uh, of the existing grounds. Um, so th those those are a couple of the, the the main reasons for it, it's it's, uh, but but gravity wise, position wise, it, it's it's a helpful place for us uh, in terms of getting water to, to flow there. Two more questions so far. Um, will you be removing all the flora in the colored areas on the map? Oh, well, great great question. Uh, you know the, these uh, these colored areas are are, are a bit. Uh, overdrawn to sort of highlight the area that we'll generally be working in. 
our, our intention is to is to maintain the the existing landscaping as as uh, as much as possible. So our focus in uh, for installing the the permeable concrete is really to remove that the existing concrete soil that's that's there currently and replace that with with permeable concrete. Similarly, our our focus is on removing the the DG in front of the visitor center and replacing that with with pavers. So so not getting into the the, the landscaping nearby. And the next question, I'm not sure if it's for Greg or for Allison, but it says, can we please review the timeline, particularly res with respect to school tours that might come back on site? I think this wouldn't start until late next spring, and I'm not sure who wants to speak to that. I can speak to that. Um, so the idea is, is the way that P2S has this project timelined out is it shouldn't impact closing the site except for maybe one week, which would most likely be in the summer, when we have to install the cistern. Uh, while it's not written in stone, we're looking at a one week closure in the entirety of this construction. So we will be able to do school tours and public tours. We now may have to reroute how we do school tours, especially when we're in phase one, since typically the schools meet in front of the big green gates at the house. So I have to do some rerouting, but it doesn't preclude us from doing school tours in 2021 when they come back on site. And same with public tours, we may just have to do some rerouting, but that um, P2S has worked really diligently in making sure we can stay open. Uh, just to echo Allison, that uh, we, we recognize it, it's critical that the Rancho uh, be, be open and to, to keep welcoming students and visitors th throughout this project. and, and hence some of the phased approach so that we're only working in, in designated areas at a time so that we can we can plan around that and that that is something that will be be dictated in the in the construction requirements for, for anyone that's going to build this project that that they un understand and adhere to those those important restrictions okay another question we have uh, is there an archaeological team selected to oversee excavation for the cistern that's a that's a, a good question as well. Uh, a specific team has has not been uh, has not been selected yet. That would be part of the, the bidding process during, during construction. Um, but but uh, making sure that the any areas like like that are are, are uh, that, that that would be part of the essentially the, the bid package that would go out to to any construction team looking to to do this work. Okay, next question. Thank you. And next question, how is the water going to be used? Will it be used, for example, to water the gardens? Um, and if so, will there be pumping equipment or how does that all work? Great question. So there, there will be a pump, uh, uh, an electric pump that is installed within a submersible pump within the cistern itself. And that will, that will pump and tie into the general irrigation system of, of the rancho. So so the team will be able to use cistern water when it's available, and then use uh, current city water, you know, it, when when the cistern is, has been emptied and, and exhausted during during dry weather. So. One more question, um, and I think it's a great one to end on, unless we we get more. But Greg, what really excites you about this project, and are these kinds of projects common? Uh, well, frankly. Uh, one of the things that excites me about this project is that it's not common, right? So, uh, you know, I mean, obviously the, the the rancho is, you know, it's you know, it's a, a special heart of of the city, right? So the chance to to work on that, to to leave a uh, to to leave a little mark on the you know the the, the long history of the rancho is is exciting. Uh, to 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 work on a project to to do a project that's ultimately going to to make the rancho a you know, sort of advance the rancho's mission, right? To, to help students learn about, you know, sort of responsible water use in the sort of arid, arid, arid region that we live in it is important uh, to help the rancho, you know, be a, you know, a, a more sustainable place, you know, for, for the next, you know, 10 generations, you know, so, so that, that's exciting. I mean, for me, I, I, my, my family and I live, you know, not, not far away here in Bixby Knowles and, 
you know, when we, you know, get, get over there and get to go for a walk and, and you know, walk through the rancho, it, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, I'm excited to, to see it come to fruition, to see, see the project get built out and, uh, and, you know, to be able to, to, you know, add a little bit to the, to the long history. So yeah, it, it's, it's a great project. Yeah. We actually did have one more question from um, a volunteer who's called in and she was wondering to what depth does soil need to be removed in order to install the permeable system? Yes, yeah, uh, very, very, uh, very good question. And uh, um, so the, the pavers in and of themselves and the, the permeable concrete in itself can allow water to go past, but if you just, if you, if you don't have any sort of a base beneath that, the, the water really doesn't have anywhere to infiltrate, anywhere to go. So we're looking at uh, between six and nine inches of, of excavation in that area, which will, which will generate uh, uh, you know, a reasonable amount of soil and, and understanding that, uh, um, that, that cut, as, as you know, the, the civil engineers would say, how much soil we need to um, ultimately remove from the site is, is important to, um, you know, is in, you know, those important aspects. And so that, that's something that the, the, our civil engineer on the project, the JLA, has looked, looked closely at. And we are looking at um, between six and nine inches. I think we actually got one more in the Q&A box as well. There, oh, yeah. there you go, kind of technical, right. but uh, will all the existing piping be replaced for non-potable water? Will the existing piping be replaced for non-potable water? You know, uh, that I, I have to admit, I don't, I don't quite capture the question. I don't quite uh, know, know what the question is getting at. We will, um, we will use as much of the existing storm drain system as, as possible. Uh, there will be some areas where we're installing new storm drains to uh, to transfer that water from from where we can collect it uh, to um, to to the cistern, um, and that that trenching will happen, uh, you know, through, through the uh, through through the driveway. Um, so again, to to avoid uh, um, you know, disrupting the landscaping, uh, we'll we'll tie into the uh, some of the existing storm drains that are uh, um, that, you know they're coming off the the visitor center, for example, to to reuse as much as much as possible there. Uh, as far as the irrigation system goes, um, as, as we pump water out of the uh, out of the, the cistern, we'll we'll look to tie into the, the existing um, irrigation system as, as quickly as possible there as well. So trying to trying to limit construction cost and, and maintain as much of, of the existing infrastructure as we can. Hope that was the hope I got to the gist of the uh, the question then. If I can interject, the rancho will not be using the city's non-potable water. We will continue to use the city water that we are currently using. When we have water in the cistern, that will be an added bonus for us. So we will not be tearing up the existing pipe to put in the purple non-potable piping sure. that is used throughout the city. Uh, it will be um, just a little extra bonus that we get from that cistern, but we are not tearing out the irrigation system. I hope, because there's a lot of questions about that coming up. So I hope that clears it up. Sure, that, that, that's right. Uh, purple pipe is, is not envisioned to be part of this, the, the, this project at the moment. We're, we're uh, um, the, you know, the, the, our intention is to essentially reduce the amount of potable water that that the rancho is is using by by capturing and reusing on site as much rainwater as we can. Well, at least one person thanks you, uh, and another one says he worked with you at the port. One of our volunteers. I think we're all just so excited to hear about what's going on. We've kind of heard there's a water project, uh, and to hear some of the exciting details. Any last thoughts or words that you want to share with us? No, I I, I just say you know um, you know this. You know, it, it's a pleasure to work with the, the Rancho team, but you know, it's not lost on me that, that a lot of what keeps the Rancho going is, is, is all the volunteers and the, the sort of commitment from, from, the, from the community. And so it's, you know, it's great to see folks on, on, the, uh, on the call. And, and yeah, I think uh, uh, another big, big thank you to the Port of Long Beach for, for making uh, 
a big chunk of this project possible. I mean, that, 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 that's, a, that's a huge huge investment in the recognition of the value of the rancho. So. With that, I'll say thank you very much for the, for the time and the opportunity. Yeah, we're, we're excited to, uh, to get this project going. Thank you for joining us. I think we're uh, back to Laura. Uh, Laura, hopefully your speaker is, your mic is working a little better. There were a lot of people, including myself, that had a hard time hearing you. Maybe if I pull my computer closer, I don't know. Uh, is that any better? Whoa. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we left off. Thank you, Greg. That was fascinating. I am so excited about this environmentally important uh, program to capture California's uh, most precious resource, water, to, to quench. So I'm going to move us on to poll number three. Did I, I shared those results, so I need to close that one and go on to the next one. No, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm sorry. Um, I'm being technically challenged here. Just a minute. <laughs> oh my gosh. I gotcha. It's up, and it will be up, it's up. Okay. So this poll asks, which month of the year usually receives the least amount of rainfall in Long Beach? June, July, or coming up on August. I got kicked out. <clears throat> So three quarters of you have voted. We'll give you another minute. Laura, you ready to see the results? Yes. All right. 60% chose August. And uh, that is not a uh, the right answer. The right answer is July only receives one hundredth of an inch of rain. Um, June receives six times that, six, ten, six hundredths of an inch of rain, and August receives twice as much as June, more than twice as much, over over uh, well thirteen hundredths of a percent. So, um, guys, were wrong, but. Good guesses. <laughs> All right. Well, we have another poll coming up here. Ready? Which two months of the year did the rancho use the most water generally? Which two months? And specifically in the last two years that Laura's been keeping track. Okay. You can choose between June, July, August, September, October, or November. And you can choose two. All right, All half right. of you have voted. Two thirds, getting there. About ready to share the results. Get your votes in, press submit. Three, two, one. All right, Laura, what do the results look like to you? People uh, like well, people said September, and uh, the right answer is two answers. There's two answers. The, the months that we use the most water over the last two years are July and October, when we used over 300, just over 300,000 gallons of water which is uh, equivalent uh, to almost 30 of those swimming pools. So. Mm. 
Be That's sure. a lot of water. That is a lot of water. Now where's the next pole? There we go. Let's see what the results. Doc Jerry results. And the fifth pole. When one inch of rain, oh, launch pulling. When okay. one inch of rain falls, how much water will the rancho be able to collect? Once we have this cool new water storage project. Right. Thanks, once, Greg. <laughs> once that cistern is built and all those permeable things are uh, launching it. So only three of you voted. Let's have. Eighty percent of vote that might be. Oh, there goes one more. Okay, we'll share the results. Well, they are getting you know, smarter. They are. Most of you got the right answer. It is 22,000 gallons, this same amount as uh, is, is the thing. And now, on to our last poll. This one's really tough. Yes. <laughs> What will you have? What is your favorite water-based uh, beverage? Tough decision. People are trying to think, what do I want? It's pretty easy for me. All right, 82% have voted. I think we're almost done. Can we get that last vote in there? 25 of you have voted. Any more? Three, two, one. And water was by, by quite a bit the most popular uh, drink that people like, followed by wine. And I'm going to guess that's potable water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> We're not all backpackers. <laughs> okay. All right. Those were for fun. Yes, I hope you enjoyed those. They were somewhat uh, educational. And um, so moving on, I want to thank our volunteer council for serving over the last year. We had Terry Barber, Alan Fox, uh, Emily Rader, Jean Marquez, Susan and Susan Mayo, who have brought you an amazing array of brown bags before we went into our current situation. And two of those people have served out their term and they have we have volunteers that have, thank you for all you've done. And we have new volunteers. Alan Fox is going to step down and Donald Specker is going to be replacing him on the volunteer council. And Emily Rader, who in, interestingly brought us the brown bag in, earlier in the year or late last year that was all about the history of water in California was a wonderful contribution to uh, our volunteer brown bags. And she is stepping down and Joy Zadaka is going to be replacing her on the volunteer council. So I'm really happy to, I would like to get that um, group together again, meeting and think of the way that that group is going to function in this new normal that we found, find ourselves in. So look for um, information from me, uh, trying to figure out a time when we all can meet and a way we all can meet. You'll be hearing about that from me very soon. And um, remember, if you are later on on YouTube or on our website watching this, 
let me know so I can give you the volunteer hours. We're kind of hard pressed to get those volunteer hours these days in the new normal, but um, we still want to get you working towards your uh, bed is in your And also, if, remember to send me for our next quick notes, we are going to have the vicarious vacation issue. Since many of us are not able to have our normal vacations, we're going to have it vicariously by sharing our favorite vacation uh, place and why that's your favorite vacation place. So please send those to me by Saturday. And any other items you'd like to share with your fellow volunteers. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Megan. Okay, I'm back. I'm trying to have my mic and my <laughs> announcement at the same time. So first of all, um, thank you so much to everyone who helped put this together. We love to have these virtual gatherings every month. Um, the next one will not be for a month. It will be on the 18th of August. We do them on the third Tuesday of the month. Meanwhile, the Rancho is open. The Rancho is open as we always have been, Wednesday through Sunday afternoons, one to five. We have an incredible crew. Uh, some people coming every week, some people coming once a month, some people coming somewhere in between there. Um, but letting Laura know when they're available to come. We have greeters, we have wayfinders, people doing sanitizing. We also, beyond our public hours, have more volunteer opportunities and even more coming on board. But those folks who are there to allow the public to see the Rancho Wednesday through Sunday afternoons, one to five, plus our extended hours on Saturday, we're open from nine to six. Our hats off to you, we appreciate you one and all. And all those folks who come during non-public hours, well, you tend to make it beautiful for public hours. So while you're out there learning how to garden or dust or uh, sort textiles or anything else, create crafts from the garden products, um, all of it just helps support the Rancho. We had been very hopeful that we could open our courtyard gates, um, but you know, when we said that at the end of June, uh, then we had 4th of July and the governor says, could we not open so quickly? And then a few weeks ago, people are kind of stalling their plans. So these times are just uncertain as we know. And while we would love to open the courtyard gates, it creates more touch points and more uh, things that we just need to be real certain about before doing. So we will open those gates, we're good to go. Uh, when we open the gates, our plan is to open um, as soon as we can the doors to the rooms in the courtyard. So not to have guided tours where we go in the rooms and hand things as we always have loved to do, but at least allow people to peek in the rooms, um, whether through doors or windows of the courtyard rooms, and also um, to put more information for those who like to stroll with content um, on our Clio app and on laminated things that they can borrow so people can know. Plus, of course, our amazing docents are often much more knowledgeable than anything that we could post. Uh, so that's the, the sort of uh, vision. You'll be delighted to know, those of you who are familiar with the house, that our curator, Sarah, has moved some collections items closer to the doors, so you'll be able to see things um, up close. Uh, and Laura will update you um, when uh, that's going to actually happen. Meanwhile, some other good news, our museum shop is up and running. We have a kind of retail to go where people can order ahead and then come pick up. Oh, dried persimmons are a pretty hot seller right now, and we're soon about to have one new product in our store, but I'm going to hold off on announcing what that is because I don't know exactly when it's going to be in there, and I don't want to disappoint you. Check quick notes. We might just be able to tell you about the brand new product coming to our museum shop store. Yummy treats reminds me though, something that came up on Saturday, our picnic area is not yet open to the public. It is closed, we're sorry about that. Um, but we do have people coming who wanna have a picnic. Um, we just have to let people know that's not something that we can allow right now because it's not something that the city allows right now. All right, so that's our public hours and our museum shop. 
Uh, I want to tell you, remind you that tomorrow we have our next virtual coffee hour. Uh, those are a lot of fun. We have maybe a dozen, maybe a few more people who hang out, uh, drink coffee or tea or whatever they'd like to drink at 10.15 uh, Wednesday morning. We also have some games that we're playing. Laura's going to send out the um, reminder tonight so that if you uh, didn't download the, the information in the past, you'll have the code to log in, but we're going to, um, she'll let you know about the game Psych that we'll be playing as well tomorrow. We have something very exciting this Sunday. We have a virtual volunteer opportunity. Marcia told me that she'll do virtual parking because we're going to have a virtual concert. Um, we were fortunate a few weeks ago to have the band that we'd already um, engaged for the July concert. They came and they spent a day recording the concert in our garden and we will stream it live this Sunday night at 5.30. We sure hope you'll join us, whether you do so on YouTube or on our Facebook Live. Um, it'll be there for you. It is an incredible band. I'm going to show an incredibly... Uh, not crummy, but not awesome <laughs> uh, uh, clip that I filmed when they came and were at the ranch show. Here you go. Uh, how do I get it back to the beginning? Can you see my screen? Yep, it's up. Thank you, let me, there we go. Okay, ready for Susie Hansen's Latin band? No sound. No audio. Oh, man. Let me. Oh, well, you're going to have to tune in on Sunday. They rock. They're so much fun. They're six band members and they're. Um, uh, film crew that was there uh, filming for us. So no audio. Sorry about that. If I can make it happen towards the end of the meeting, I will. But otherwise, um, it, you're going to have to take my word for it. They are really great. Now, so I've told you about our next virtual gathering. I've told you about our public hours. I've told you about our coffee tomorrow morning. I hope you join us at 1015. I've told you about the concert on Sunday. Guess what? We have virtual stuff coming on Monday. Alana, can you remind us what's happening? Well, we have virtual camp starting on Monday. Um, so for those of you who have been around the Rancho in summers past, we usually host several weeks of, site, of camp on site where kids come, um, do a lot of hands-on historically inspired projects. Also, I just adopted a puppy and she, uh, as interesting as this presentation is, she doesn't appreciate being cooped up. So sorry for the noise in the background. But um, sh so for camp, we usually are on site, but with um, things so up in the air um, with restrictions and then trying to keep uh, the safety of campers and volunteers and staff in mind, uh, we decided to do virtual camp um, but trying to uh, still keep the elements that made our camps unique and fun. So we want to have the, the hands-on projects, but also some of that interactive time. So the virtual camp is a combination of Zoom activities and then um, independent projects at home. So throughout the day, there are four different Zoom activities. So there's a morning greeting and check-in. And at the end of the day, there's um, a check-in and sort of sharing of what people did and enjoyed throughout the day. And then the other two things are a get moving activity. So even though people are at home, there's still hopefully um, our campers are moving around and getting some of that physical time in. And then also um, guest speakers so that they the learning about other topics and also hearing from people other than just me. So we have Rancho Los Alamitos on Monday and they're sharing um, some of the animals uh, including Preston, their horse, and I think their sheep and their goats. Um, we also have a beekeeper and my friend who works in forestry. So um, broadening it beyond just the rancho, but still everything's all connected. Um, and then there are 
craft kits that the families pick up or can have shipped to them that have the materials that they need to do the craft. So in between those Zoom activities, they have the materials and the instructions to work on crafts and games and activities independently at home. So trying to find the balance between the hands-on activities and still getting some of that interactive spirit. Um, so trying to keep that, that camp spirit alive, even in a virtual format. So very excited about that. We we're still have registrations open. Um, this first week is Nature Camp. It's for elementary school. The following week is Time Travelers Camp, which is a, a change in date. So the next week will be Time Travelers Camp also for elementary schoolers. And then the final week is, what we used to call Unplugged because it was getting kids away from technology for middle schoolers. Um, this year it's unplugged, but it's replugged because they have to use a computer. Um, so still really excited about that. And we can take more uh, campers for all of those camps. So if you know kids in your own family or friends, they don't even have to be in Long Beach. They could be anywhere um, and we can have the kits shipped to them. So uh, feel free to ask me if you have any questions. And I do have a little kind of teaser for camp. Um, and the context for this is that I grew up watching PBS and my favorite show was called Wishbone. And it was, the main character was a Jack Russell Terrier named Wishbone and he would act out classic literature. Um, so it would be just a very condensed version of the plot of all of these classic literature novels and stories. And um, they would sort of tie in with the problems that his humans were facing. So I think it's starting in like middle school and then getting into high school. So they'd be ha facing bullying in school. And then that would remind Wishbone of a classic novel and he would act it out and he'd be in costumes and he would act it out with these humans and no one ever acknowledged that he was a dog and it was amazing. And so um, in an attempt to recreate that for camp, we, um, my, the Reese family has created the character of Sherlock Bones, who is my dog Sykes dressed up as a detective. Um, so I have a a little video to share with you. Um, so it is still a work in progress. I haven't adjusted all of the audio. So I'm sorry, there is there are parts that are a little louder and a little bit softer and not all of the sound effects are added in, but just to give you um, an idea of what that will be. And let me share computer sound and optimize. Okay, here we go. Why, hello, the name is Bones. Sherlock Bones. I am a history detective, meaning I find clues to help me learn about the past. How was it different from today? How was it similar? Today, I will be investigating one of my favorite topics, food. How do we prepare food today? And how did they prepare it in the past? I'm off to the kitchen to investigate. This is an oven where food is cooked and baked. The energy to make this oven work comes from gas, but there are also electric ovens that use electricity for power. On the stovetop burners, the gas makes flames to heat things up, like this soup. You can control how fast things are heated by making the flames smaller or larger. Inside the oven, things are baked. This process is still powered by the gas, but does not use flames. In here we see one of my favorite snacks baking, cookies. Now the next mystery to solve who ate the rest of my cookies? Gas stoves didn't become popular until the early 1900s. So how did people cook and bake before that? I have traveled to Rancho Los Cerritos in the year 1850 to find some clues to answer this question. I think I've spotted some clues. Perhaps there is someone here who can tell me a bit more about them. Amigo, bienvenidos a mi horno. Esta es mi cocina. This is my kitchen. This is my oven where I cook the meals for the workers. Would you like to see it? 
There he is. Excellent. Well, right in there, I heat this Orno up with this firewood for four hours. It takes a good long while, but once it's heat up, the earth is nice and warm. And all that energy built up in the in the Orno can now go onto the dough and it becomes bread, which my workers can eat. You see this right here, this is adobe, which is a combination of clay, dirt, water, sand, and straw put together and dried for many weeks until it's nice and hard. And this is what we use to build this orno. This is also what built the Grand Casa over here. The great house is built out of this material as well. It's a good material and what this does with all its thickness, it holds all that heat and energy so that we could eat some pan, some bread that we could cook in here. And I think it might be ready. Ah, yes, I see. It is still hot in here. Now, where is this bread that you were talking about? See over here, Ooh, you can still feel it's pretty hot, but I think the pan, the pan is ready. Let's take it out. Take a look at that. Mmm, delicioso, que rico, wouldn't you say? Well, my friends, there you have it. Mystery solved. Outdoor ovens called hornos were fueled or powered by burning wood. It took much longer to do any baking back then, but that bread smelled almost as delicious as my cookies. Until we meet again to investigate our next history mystery. So that is Sherlock Bones. <laughs> and uh, it's been quite amusing for me anyway to film and to edit. Um, so thank you all for watching it. It was a pleasure to share it with you. Um, and there will be a disclaimer at the end. Uh, Sherlock Bones, as a dog who is not a service animal, is receives special dispensation to be on rancho grounds. So only service animals and uh, history detectives are allowed to be on rancho grounds. So um, again, if you have any questions about Camp or Sherlock Bones, um, let me know. And I think the campers are getting first look access to Sherlock Bones, um, but I think we will eventually share the videos um, with the public should they, should they be popular enough to warrant that sharing. Um, so anyway, uh, I will turn it back over to Laura. Uh, we've had a request to see your new dog. Oh, well, she, I, when we do the check-ins, I'll bring her back. She, she was released so that she could run around a little bit. Okay. All right. Now it's time to hear from and see all of you. So hold tight and we are going to promote you to uh, panelists so that we can see you and hear you. So... Here we go. Sit down here. To unmute. Your muse is available. Yes. Well, well, as we're all joining us again, here is here's Lilo. She's teething, so she likes to chew on things. She also has lots of energy and doesn't like to stand still for very long. Um, but she was being fostered by well, hello, one of our board members. Uh, so, and she is. Uh, the light of my life and sometimes a pain in the butt, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And I think she said it's time to go oh. now. So. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, I think we have promoted everybody and... Oh, there we are. <laughs> All right, yes, there we go. So, how's everybody doing? Anybody wants to uh, shout out what you thought about uh, anything you saw tonight or whatever you would like to share with us? Go ahead and raise your hand and uh, unmute yourself and. We thought the dog was an Academy Award winning performance. <laughs> I will I will pass the message along. Very cute. Makes me want to go to summer camp and I go. <laughs> Donald, you raised your hand. Did you want to hear about the water project? I'm muted. I unmuted you. Okay. Yeah, it's nice to hear about the water project. I mean, I've just heard that such a thing was going to happen, but it was great to hear the detail. And they did such a good job with it. So it's really encouraging and exciting. Anybody else? Is Greg still with us or did he depart? Uh, he, he dropped off. I just, I appreciated, you know, his comments at not, I mean, I like the, the presentation, but his comments at the end that seemed, sounded like he had a heart for the rancho and the, you know, the work that, or what the rancho represents. And so that, you know, to me, that makes it special. It's not just a job that's happening at the rancho, but that it's, uh, you know, a participation and, and so great to hear the um, Port of Long Beach um, participation as well. So thank you. That was really very interesting. Yeah, I agree with you, Leslie. I think um, Tessa originally met um, one of the principals at Studio 111 uh, back in 2018. And they were just so excited about the RAND show and getting connected with it that they helped us design the whole project before, you know, pro bono. And then we got introduced to P2S and they were just as excited about the RAND show and the fact that they got to do this amazing project at an amazing historic site where so much of their work is on commercial buildings. And this was a totally, totally different place. And to be with that history and to share that history and be part of like the future history really meant a lot to them. So we're, they're, amazing partners and they have really put their heart and soul into this project. They've been great and it really shows. Terry? You're muted. I can't unmute you. Terry, you have to unmute. There you go. I'm unmuted now. Hey, everybody hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, I've probably known Greg longer than I want to even admit. <laughs> um, because I retired from the port almost six years ago now, and I knew him for a long time when he worked at the port. And he is the most enthusiastic person. We are so lucky to have him. You, you might have seen just a little bit of that when he was talking, but when you actually get to talk to him and which some of you probably have in person, you're going to find out that he really has, once he gets started on a project, he really, really goes strong at it and he wants to get her done. <laughs> so when he tells you it's going to be, you know, six weeks, he's going to be on schedule most likely uh, or even quicker because he has a way with getting things done. He's good at it. So um, although he didn't have all that facial stuff when I saw met him, <laughs> When all the time that I knew him, so I had to look through all that to see him. <laughs> yeah, that's the COVID-19 year, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm never going to let mine go that bad, go that long. <laughs> but no, anyway. he might have gotten his inspiration from you, Terry. What's that? He no. might have gotten his inspiration from you. 
beard. On the beard. Oh, there. Hey, you know, maybe that's true. Because <laughs> I've had a beard for a long time. <laughs> And it wasn't the color it is now either back then. It, it was probably the color of his. <laughs> Not a complaint? No. <laughs> Everybody's so quiet. Somebody next. Who's next? I just would like to also give a shout out to Terry. Thank you for your um, messages that you send out. You send out such positive messages and particularly oh, now in the COVID times, it's, it's appreciated. <laughs> well, watch out because there's another one coming. I was oh, talking <laughs> Anyway, thanks. I've read the entire book on Abel Stearns and uh, Holy cow, do I have a whole bunch of information on that guy. I feel like I lived with him after reading a couple of books on him. So uh, I should be going over to Rancho, another Rancho to <laughs> tell people. <laughs> but still, it is affiliated with the area because he was part of the land that uh, Nieto owned. So it really is fit in with the Rancho in many ways. So. Yeah, I meant to get one out before this uh, meeting to remind everyone of it, Laura, but I didn't do it. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, well, speaking of reminders, um, we'd like to take a picture of everybody now. So if everybody could smile and if you have a camera like Grace just started hers. Oh, come on. Start your camera back up again, Grace, so we can uh include you in the picture for quick notes there you are thank you grace okay alana is going to take the picture everybody ready three two one click <laughs> all right we got it super it's really great to see all of you here um anybody else have any more comments or grace well, i'm sorry i missed it i had every intention of trying to get home but i got stuck doing some other things that took longer and i'm just you know on the tail end you're not you didn't happen to uh, record it did you yes we do we record them all and oh, okay when we have it edited and put it up on youtube i will and our website i'll send everybody the link so that you can oh, fantastic continue. thank you so everybody that wasn't able to make it here tonight or forgot can still uh see this program so yes it usually takes a few days sometimes a little bit longer depending on uh i'm this not schedule. in any hurry especially i just i'm sorry i missed it <laughs> Yeah, this has been in the works for a while and a lot of us don't have all the details, but now the people on this call at least have a lot more uh, sense of what's what's going to come next spring sometime and then take about a year or so. I have no a idea of, what you're talking about. about so. A <laughs> lot of us are familiar with long. the problems that water has wrought, so. Okay. <laughs> All right, anybody else? You can see the uh, actor who plays Sherlock Bones there with Leslie and Ron sharing the screen. Uh, oh, hard to recognize when he's not in costume or in his accent. <laughs> yeah, keeping it low key, you know, to avoid the press, but that is tonight. I wanted to ask Laura if Sykes could sign up for volunteer hours. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, come on, Laura, you're low on them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> he wears a costume. What more do you need? <laughs> Does that count as living history? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it kind of would be. I definitely thank Leslie for all of the time she put into it and for sending me those hours. <laughs> 
also want to thank Marie, what, what you put together, Marie. I'm sorry, we had a little bit of technical difficulties. So thanks to everyone for bearing with us, but um, that will be on there as well, Grace. It's not just the current water project, but Marie gave us a history of water technology. Um, oh, okay. Did, did anyone have any questions? I don't know if any got directed towards Marie during the Q&A, but um, she's a font of knowledge and she's still on the call. Well, hopefully that'll get edited. <laughs> The next really slide. Valuable. <laughs> History. This is Laura Salazar. And I want to say, Mary, could I please uh, get on your cheer up mailings? Um, <laughs> there, there's my address if you want to send me something by hotmail. And uh, Laura, make sure I get the news about the meeting tomorrow. Okay, I'm. I am going. I I will send you a separate email because it turns out whenever Laura gets sent something with a few people on the email, it doesn't get to her. So I will make sure you get it. Oh, I'm bugging poor Laura all the time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think. Um, a lot of us have been wondering about the water ram. Did everybody appreciate learning uh, what a water ram actually is from Marie? Finally, I've been wondering that for years. In under one minute. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done, Marie. <laughs> All right. I have a question before oh, we Tessa, sign off. Go ahead, Tessa. Um, Marie, when I've gone on tours or even when I've followed school tours, so Megan, I might direct this to you as well. I don't see a lot um, about our water tower. And so I was wondering if you could give me a little overview of this recreated water tower. When was it rebuilt? What, do you want to handle mean? that, Megan, or shall I? Um, I'm going to pull up this slide. So why don't you handle that? I didn't see, I'm sorry if I missed it in your presentation, Marie. No, that got cut out. <laughs> <laughs> the water tower, the, where the water tower is now was built by the Bixby's and it was installed around the 1870s and it was outside of the garden. It was on the opposite side of the fence. Mm. And that's when they put up the windmill. And when Cornell designed the estate garden, they captured that property. And he thought it was worthwhile to use as a garden sculpture. So he, when he was designing it, that's where he put the secondary orchard. So you have the water with the agricultural product. I thought it was very subtle, um, but I love that, that concept of it. It's wood, it was redwood. But even redwood has its day. And eventually it began to fall apart. And around the 1970s, 80s, Long Beach City College tried to reinforce it and rebuild it. Uh, and that's when the bottom was completely, whatever was left of the bottom was taken out and put in with screen. Wood still decays. And we had a, another, another grant and that grant paid for everything to be rebuilt. Unfortunately, even the pieces that, were sa that we had saved from the 1870s were so termite ridden, they could no longer be used. But it is built to specs and built in place to where it was in the 1870s. Does that answer your question? Because I can go on. <laughs> I'll just add to that, that for school tours, it's a transition from the area where the Orno is, where we typically do tours, to the garden, the herb garden. And so a lot of times volunteer docents are able to talk about the importance of water, but depending on that particular transition, there may or may not be time. Two fun facts. Um, in the building of the new visitor center and the restoration of that uh, 1870s above ground water tower. One is that we were able to use some of those pieces of the windmill 
in our new visitor centers. So if you haven't noticed it, it's above where the Spanish soldier costume is, um, as the where the pitched roof is, we have kind of a fan, and that's actually blades from the windmill. Oh, and the Megan, other one, that is not actually the windmill from the 1870s. Oh, one of the windmill. It's not. It was when we when at one point they thought they were taking the whole property back to the 1870s, and at that point somebody donated a windmill. That windmill has been sitting in the maintenance yard. And when we were building the visitor center, it was just like, hey, maybe we could use this. <laughs> and that's, so that's a kind of fun fact. The other thing is um, Llewellyn Bixby had a picture where he posed standing on the, um, there's a ladder going up to the windmill. So when uh, he posed sometime in the 1930s, and I thought I saw Greg and Janice on this call earlier, but I don't see him now when we had the water tower restored it's capped off now we're not storing water in it there's a a lid there's probably another name for that but a top over the water tower so water does not go in there but greg uh robeson dressed as llewellyn bixby stood on that ladder with some of his granddaughters there some of our board members and other family members in attendance as we recreated that picture so that water tower does a lot of things and it doesn't always get equal play in our school tours, but we certainly try to talk about the importance of water and how to water such a glorious garden when time permits. Is the other uh, well thing that's in the, in the, like where, you know, the, by the, I don't know, that sundial thing, it's down on the ground and I call it in, four, in box four on the ground, is that still there? The well in the dye and dry garden is still there. It is capped off. It is the active wellhead. And um, unfortunately, there well, there might be water there. That water, when you consider what this particular area has been through with the country club since the 1920s, particulate that has flowed into the water there is makes it non-usable. So it is. You've got pesticides, you've got um, herbicides, you've got fertilizers. DDT was used at that time. It's not anything, because when I found out that we had a well, <laughs> it was just like, great, can we use this? And then they talked about the quality water. And it was just like, never mind, we're leaving it down there. But the cap to the well is still there, Marsha. We're keeping it there just because I like to talk about it. I don't say that it has water in it, but I mean, we are keeping it there. It's going to stay there as long as we can have it there. Yay, thanks. All right, so Laura is going to be sending out the reminder for those who would like to join us tomorrow for virtual coffee conversation and, of course, really cool games. Uh, and we'll hope to see you all at the concert on Sunday, streaming from the Rancho's YouTube and Facebook at 5.30. We hope not to have any technical glitches, but we appreciate all of those who are here at 5.15 waiting for us to go online. Uh, but we did get that PowerPoint up and running. That was our glitch, and we're really glad about it. Laura had a little glitchy voice, but she heroically led us through our silly polls on water or those were the educational ones that you missed, but the silly ones you got. <laughs> uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Laura, any last word for our incredible volunteers? Thanks for coming. It was great to see all of you together. And I'm glad that we were able to share all this information for with you. And I'm glad I get to see a lot of you around the Rancho. So stay safe. And hopefully I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>